Our scripture reading is from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, the prologue of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not overcome it. May God add a blessing to the reading of the Holy Scriptures. Will you join me in prayer? Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Good morning. It is so good to be here today. We spent the month of October tackling some really hard questions and playing around with some fairly important theological categories. Now, I've presented my take on a lot of these stuff. I've, I, a lot of these categories, I've, I've shared my opinion about them and then shifted around a few more categories. So one might ask, when I'm doing all this shifting, why I choose Christianity. So that's what this sermon is going to be about. Why do I choose Christianity? And I'm going to answer as Bill Hen, right? This is my journey that I'm going to share with you. Hopefully, it will address the question is why I choose Christianity. And I'd like to start off with a story, actually, and that it hits right at the heart of the matter. It's a story that I'm pretty sure that you've heard. There was a man who saw the people, his people, in fact, and they were not in a good way. He could clearly see them struggling to make meaning, struggling to find their way, struggling to survive, in fact. What was clear is that they were trying to do it the way they had been taught, but it was not working. And compassion overflows from him at that point. He knew that in order to save them, something drastic had to be done. And he didn't want to do it. That was clear. He didn't want to do it, but in the face of immeasurable suffering and no end in sight, he made his decision. And when Commander Spock stepped into the engineering section of the Enterprise, his body was flooded with radiation, ensuring his death. But because of his sacrifice, the Starship Enterprise was saved from the wrath of Khan. Thank you, Josh Antko, for that idea, by the way. Yeah, yeah. One of my favorite classes in seminary um, was Theological Issues in Film. And I've referenced it many times when I've been up here. We watched like 25 secular movies uh, before the semester started in order to see and explore and experience the gospel being presented in these secular movies. It was fascinating to see elements of our gospel, our good news, making their way into secular storytelling. Our final paper involved us picking any movie we want and writing about the gospel elements that were present. My professor started the semester by saying that he is a fan of almost all movie genres except science fiction. He said he hated science fiction movies, and so I wrote my final paper on Star Trek II. And he wrote on the bottom of my paper, I got a really good grade in that class, and it's my favorite professor, he didn't normally give great grades, but I got a great grade on that one, and he wrote on the bottom, he said, this is worthy of a book award, and a book award is one of the highest things you can get in seminary, each professor chooses a student that excels and gives them a book award and a ceremony. He said, this is worthy of a book award, but I'm not going to give it to you because I'm afraid you're going to come to the ceremony in t-shirt and gym shorts, is what he said. (laughs) wild. So the class pushed us to recognize the gospel, the good news, outside of the church. We're going to come back to that concept here in a second. Let's get back to our initial question. Why do I choose Christianity? Well, at the start, I didn't choose Christianity. Christianity was chosen for me. I was raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And so Of course I was raised in a Christian household. My great-grandfather was a disciple. My grandparents were disciples. My parents were disciples. Our disciples. You guys are here. It's fine. Um, (laughs) And I have been a disciple my entire life. It's the waters that we currently swim in. And I had such a wonderful, caring, nurturing church experience 
growing up. I mean, I loved First Christian Jinx and all the wonderful people that were there. And I thought church was wonderful, and I made no delineation between God and church. In my mind and in my experience, they were one in the same. And then I went to seminary. Church history was one of the first classes that I took. And if, you have a, if you've ever read anything about church history, then you know how messed up it has been for over two millennia. I mean, the Council of Trent, the Council of Nicaea, Constantine, inquisitions, beheadings, burnings at the stake, indulgences, imperialism, and brutal domination. There's very little God in church history. And I completely understand why someone would not want to be a part of such an institution. And it doesn't even have to be ancient history either. There were many American Southern churches that supported the institution of slavery. It's in the Bible, after all. And there were German churches that supported Hitler. I mean, from the pulpit supported Hitler. Follow the government, because that's in the Bible, too. The church has historically been one of the last ones to the party women's rights and LGBTQ rights and reproductive rights and racism and sexism and classism, the church seems to be one of the last ones to recognize justice. And I do want to point out that I'm talking about the capital C church, the big church, the church universal. I'm not really referencing Forest Park here. We have such an inclusive, loving community right here. But I completely understand why people do not want to be a part of any church. As wonderful as this place is right here, I get it. I get why people walk away. So after seminary, I had a choice. I was no longer bound by my ancestors' choice of being a Christian. I was no longer bound by tradition. I peeked behind the curtain and was repulsed at what I found. So the question is not why did I choose Christianity? Why do I still choose Christianity? That's the question as was discussed earlier in our sermon series last month, I'm not terrified of where my soul is going to go after I die. I will be with God, and I will be with Jesus. I'm not worried about God not forgiving my sin or removing love from me, because I don't choose this path out of fear. There's a lot of fear-based Christianity out there, but that's not me. That's not why I choose this. Jesus didn't come to bring fear. He said it many times, fear not. And Jesus didn't come to start a church. I don't love that detail, by the way, because I've made vows and I, have, I, have, I am an ordained member of the clergy, but Jesus didn't come to start a church. But when I study Jesus and learn more about Jesus and experience Jesus, and when I pay attention to the spirit that is within me, something happens that is completely unexplainable. My heart and my soul and my strength and my mind all gravitate toward two main concepts that I think flow from the Jesus movement. I mean, it gravitates to lots of concepts, but two main ones that, I, that my heart sings for joy when I hear them. The first one is the common good. When Jesus was laying out the foundation for the kingdom of God through his words and his deeds, Jesus was saying that our life together can be better. We've tried looking after just number one, or maybe even just our people, maybe just our family. But look where that's gotten us. The world is cold and treacherous without human selfishness to ruin it further. And the kingdom of God is Jesus' answer to this problem. And it perpetuates the common good. It's not just good advice. It's not just food for thought. It's not some crazy theory that Jesus is promoting. It is of God. And that is why my heart skips a beat and my soul reaches when I hear this and when I most definitely experience this. Because it's time for me, it's time to hear and heed a different call, a different way of life. A new order of living in sharp contrast to all the political and religious kingdoms of the world. And this better way of life is meant to benefit not only followers of Jesus, but everyone else too. The Jesus way is a call to a relationship that changes 
all other relationships. Let's say that one again. The Jesus way is a call to a relationship that changes and contorts and, and justifies and maneuvers all other relationships. And this new relationship brings us into loving our neighbors and the most vulnerable and even our enemies. I mean, Jesus comes out of Judaism, which is all about the common good. The ancient laws were there to protect communally God's people. So when I engage in this movement, I'm able to wade through all of the church stumbling blocks for me and go straight to Jesus. It allows me to reclaim the neglected common good and teaches me that faith can actually help instead of hurt this endeavor. Now, the second concept is very much related to the first. The second concept was read uh, by Jeannie at the very beginning of this worship service here, where we celebrate every year, every spring, resurrection. Not necessarily the event 2,000 years ago, which is awesome, and we, we celebrate that every year as well, but it's what that event points to. Resurrection happened for Jesus when he literally died to forge the path of peace. He chose the path of love, which looks foolish to the world, especially when that path of love leads to death. The world doesn't understand any of that. But God said, yeah, that's not going to be the end of this story. The process of resurrection is embedded all throughout the gospel and Jesus' radical message of love. When you die to self, when you stop putting yourself first, when you operate with your neighbor in mind, when you organize your thoughts and your mindset around the concept of radical love, when you dare to go against your culture and your community and your family by acting in love, you experience a death when that happens, at least by the world's standards. But then you rise with Christ. The scripture that I read at the start of this sermon, the prologue of John, the word was with God and the word was God. That word that John uses here is logos in Greek, and it's the essence of God. Jesus was this essence, essence in flesh, and we have that word. We have that logos within us as well. That is what rises when you die, when your ego dies. We are new creations in Christ because you're different. You see the world differently. Your priorities are different. Your politics are different. Your relationships are different. It's truly the baptism metaphor. You die to self and are raised with Christ. The common good is when we put Jesus' teachings into practice. Resurrection is the result. So I don't just choose Christianity. I race toward Christianity. I embrace this life-giving movement that in the beginning was with God and was God and now is with us. And I mess it up so many more times than I get it right. But with every success and with every failure, the invitation is always the same. Take up your cross and follow me. Thanks be to God. Amen.